Amen. It's so good to see you. If you have your Bible or your Bible app, go ahead and turn to Luke chapter 9, and we're going to start looking in verse 28. Uh, We are continuing in our sermon series called The Son of God from the Gospel of Luke. And for the rest of the year, the rest of 2022, we'll be teaching and preaching from Luke. Now, if you don't have a Bible with you, I invite you to use one of the Bibles located under the seat in front of you. You can grab that Bible and turn to page 1080. And as always, if you don't have a copy of the Word of God, a copy of the Bible that you can read or understand easily at your home, please take one of our copies home with you. We want you to have the Word of God and read the Word of God because we are firmly, uh, we are firmly convinced that if we read and apply God's Word, He will change our lives. Now, If you were alive in 1996, would you raise your hand? All right, thank you. It was my second year of college, and you might remember the name of a comet that streaked across the sky. It wasn't Halley's. It wasn't Halley Bob. It was Yakutaki. It was the comet Yakutaki that was streaming across the sky in 1996. So... I was a, it was in my second year of college at Austin P and a friend of mine were out, you know, wandering around 10, 10 30 at night. We looked up in the sky and we saw it. It was amazing. But we said, let's go get in the car and drive outside the city limits so we could see it without the city lights. So we jumped in my car, we made rights and lefts and we got outside the city limits. I had no idea where I was going. I was just turning to get away from the city lights. And as we went out, we were, got further and further away from the city. The trees got thicker and thicker and thicker on the sides of the roads. And so we were going down hills and up hills. And we finally got far enough away. I said, this is good. We looked for a clear spot away from the trees that we could see. So I saw a dirt road. I turned into this dirt road, which actually turned out to be a driveway for an old abandoned house. So my headlights hit the house and the windows were boarded up. And I thought, this is a good place to see the comet. So we jumped out of the car and we began to look at the comet and it was absolutely amazing. The sky was black, but that comet was so bright and the tail of that comet was so beautiful, it was stunning. But from the moment that I jumped out of the car, I began to get this weird feeling like somebody was watching me. You ever had that feeling like someone's watching you? Like it was this weird, overwhelming, really a sense of dread. And so 45 minutes it took us to get out there and we spent about one minute looking at the comet. Now I left my engine running and I left my headlights on and we just looked up in the sky, but I had such a sense of creepiness. I turned to my friend and said, you ready to go? And he said, yes. And as I jumped into the car, a man was walking towards us about 1130 at night, coming out of the woods, out of the thick, dense brush without making a sound. And he was walking right towards me. So I slammed the door and I yelled to my friend, get in the car. And he looked and he saw the guy and he jumped in. And it's a good thing I left my engine running because my car very seldom started on the first try. And so with the engine running, I I had to veer to the right. I had to turn left, but I veered to the right to get out around him. And as I pulled past him, he had long scruffy beard. He had long hair. He had a hat pulled down over his head, hands shoved in his pockets. And he stared at me through the driver's side window, then kicked my car as hard as he could. So I yelled, he kicked my car. And my friend said, just keep going. So I floored it. We drove through every red light, every stop sign. The whole time my heart was beating fast. When we finally pulled back onto campus, I parked in the parking spot. Then he and I both 
jumped out of the car, laid on the ground to make sure he wasn't hanging on underneath. <laughs> it was the strangest encounter of my life. And later on, we had questions like, why couldn't we hear him coming out of the woods? Why was he coming toward me? If we were trespassing, why didn't he just yell at us to scare us away? I had no answers. It was a bizarre, strange, weird encounter. And honestly, sometimes we encounter things in this life that are really difficult to explain. Maybe you've had a bizarre or strange experience in your life. You know, some people make claims that they've seen Bigfoot. Some people make claims that they've been abducted by aliens. We live near Area 51, right? Out of curiosity, I want to ask you a question. If you would help me out by raising your hand, raise your hand if you know somebody personally that has claimed to see Bigfoot. All right, we got a few... Raise your hand if you know somebody that has claimed to have seen a UFO or an alien. Look at that. That's crazy. Oh, I'm getting worried now. Raise your hand if you'd like your spouse to be abducted by an alien. <laughs> you know, Luke recorded a very strange encounter with Jesus and uh, his disciples. Two dead prophets showed up and Jesus would hang out with them on top of a hill. Then Jesus' clothes and his appearance would begin to glow and radiate. It was strange and it was bizarre, but I believe we can read this passage of scripture and we can have some great takeaways for our personal lives. So let's read together Luke chapter 9, beginning in verse 28. Now, about eight days after, though, after these sayings, he took with him Peter and John and James, and he went up on the mountain to pray. And as he was praying, the appearance of his face was altered, and his clothing became dazzling white. And behold, two men were talking with him, Moses and Elijah, who appeared in glory and spoke of his departure, which he was about to accomplish at Jerusalem." Now Peter and those who were with him were heavy with sleep, but when they became fully awake, they saw his glory and the two men who stood with him. And as the men were parting from him, Peter said to Jesus, Master, it is good that we are here. Let us make three tents, one for you, one for Moses, and one for Elijah, not knowing what he said." As he was saying these things, a cloud came and overshadowed them, and they were afraid as they entered the cloud. And a voice came out of the cloud saying, This is my son, my chosen one. Listen to him. And when the voice had spoken, Jesus was found alone. And they kept silent and told no one in those days of anything of what they had seen. Now, Again, this was a bizarre and strange experience. Men who had died hundreds of years before. Jesus' appearance being changed. The voice of God booming from within a cloud. Now, for Jesus, this was kind of a highlight of his ministry so far. This was an affirmation of God that Jesus was going to save the world from their sins and that he was the chosen son of God and that all of us as human beings need to bend our ear and our hearts to his word to listen to him and apply it to our lives. And it's interesting that in this moment, in this highlight Jesus did not seek validation from influencers. Jesus didn't seek, uh, seek validation from influencers. This was the most significant moment of his life to date, yet he did not bring the heavy hitters in the political realm to see this transformation, to hear the voice of God. He didn't bring the religious leaders so he could at least wag his you know, hands at him and say, ha, 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 I told you. 
He, he didn't bring those type of people to this moment. He, he didn't bring the heads of the tribes of Israel. He didn't invite kings and scholars and philosophers to observe this moment. He didn't seek out the popular people of the day to observe this. So many people in our culture today are seeking out validation from influencers in social media. Now, I don't know if you have social media. Most of us do. Most of us know what TikTok is. Most of us know what Instagram is, whether we're on it or not. But people today want to be recognized on social media. They want their opinion to matter more than other people. Uh, they, want their, uh, they want their recognition. They want to feel important through likes or through hearts or through comments. And if enough people like those individuals, sponsors pick them up and they pay them a lot of money to be an influencer. So I want to say this very, very, very clearly right now. You are important. You do matter. If you seek out validation for your life from other people, in the name of Jesus, stop it. You are important. Jesus has given his life for you. You matter significantly. Now, there may be nothing incredible or nothing significant about you. You may not have some type of amazing talent or some type of amazing ability. Maybe your checking account makes a homeless person feel rich, right? I mean, there may not be anything glamorous about you at all. You may be absolutely normal. Well, like Jesus demonstrates in this passage of scripture, God invites normal people to experience the abnormal. God invites normal, regular, everyday people to experience the abnormal. He took regular, ordinary people onto the mountaintop and they saw something unexpected, something unheard of. Peter, James, and John were all three regular, uneducated, untrained fishermen. And honestly, they weren't even great fishermen as well. When Jesus first encountered them, they'd been fishing all night and they hadn't caught one single fish. That tells me they weren't even very skilled at their trade that they weren't the best of the best. They were average. They were okay. They were adequate. And yet Jesus chose the very normal, regular people to experience something abnormal. And that's what God continues to do today. See, if you want to experience the abnormal in a life-changing relationship with Jesus, you, you can be wealthy or you can be poor. You can be attractive or you can be ugly. You can be a nobody or you can be a somebody. You can be married, divorced, single. You can bring all your flaws, all your faults, exactly you the way you are and surrender it all to Jesus. Jesus takes the normal and allows them to experience something abnormal. Not everybody has a relationship with God. Not everybody experience the for, experiences the forgiveness of sins. God calls the normal to an abnormal life. Now, I know normal quite well. I'm, I'm a pretty normal guy. And in many ways, I consider myself a below average Joe. I, I don't consider myself an average Joe. I consider myself a below average Joe. Now, I recognize that God has gifted me. He's gifted me as a teacher. I love teaching his word. I love helping people follow him and experience the abundant life that God has planned for them. I teach pretty transparently from the platform. 
In fact, one of our core values here at Calvary is transparent living, uh, that uh, we're honest about who we are and we invite others to be honest about themselves as well. I acknowledge my own failures quite often on the platform. I share my own struggles about how to apply God's word on a pretty consistent, regular basis. And even though I do all that, I recognize, and I've recognized recently that I'm a pretty guarded individual. It's pretty easy to be transparent up here, to be honest with you. Some of you guys are like, I could never get up and share like you share. I can tell you something. I probably can't share the way you share in conversations. I probably don't. I, I'm, I'm more guarded when I'm out on the floor shaking hands than I am from the platform. And I recognize that I have um, a lot of guardedness. I, I have experienced a lot of hurt in my childhood. I've experienced a lot of hurt in life. And it's because I'm guarded I recognize that I can come across as uncaring. Uh, because I'm guarded, because I have these barriers up, I recognize that I can come across as unloving or uncaring. And I want to do better as a pastor. I want to do better as a dad. I want to do better as a husband, as a follower of Jesus. And I want to do better and not let my, the past hurt that I experienced continue to hurt me in the future. And so I want to let you know that I am presently seeking out counseling so that I can deal with some of the baggage and some of the hurt that I've experienced in my life so that I can just become a healthier me. I can be, just become a healthier follower of Jesus. So normal people, we got problems. Normal people... If we're transparent, we recognize that we, you know, the great commission is, or the great commandment is to love God with all our heart, soul, mind, and strength, and to love our neighbor as ourselves. And normal people often have barriers that they've placed, whether they realize it or not, that gets in the way of either loving God with all their heart, soul, mind, and strength, or loving their neighbor as themselves. We should not let our problems stand in the way of experiencing the abnormal life that God has for us. So I've shared transparently, let me ask you a question. What are your barriers to growth? What are the areas of your life that needs to experience the healing power of Jesus? Now in this passage, Besides Jesus and the voice of God speaking, Peter is the only other person that is quoted in this passage of scripture. He's the only other man that speaks. And essentially, Peter is blubbering. He, he's a blubbering idiot right here. He wakes up from his nap. He doesn't know what's going on. And he blurts out one of the first things that come to his mind is, hey, let's build a tent for all three of you guys. You can all have a tent and we can just keep hanging out here forever. Moses and Elijah, the dead prophets can hang out and they can sleep and Jesus will build this shelter for you. And it's going to be amazing. In the New Living, Peter blurts out and says, Master, it's wonderful for us to be here. Let's make three shelters as memorials in the presence of something he didn't quite understand. Peter felt a need to say something. So he just blurted something out. That was Peter's personality. He often did or said things that everybody around him viewed as kind of dumb. Uh, he often viewed or said or did things that people around him thought, Peter, you are such an idiot. For example, he jumped out of, the out of a boat onto the water and sank. He, he rebuked Jesus. He told Jesus, Jesus was wrong. Essentially, a, a rebuke was, shut up. Jesus, shut up. Don't, don't, don't speak like that. He blurts out something here just to say something. Peter seemingly always struggled with his words and actions. Like you and I, Peter was a normal, ordinary guy. 
He had a lot of rough edges. He had to make a lot of apologies in life. But Jesus knew God transforms ordinary into extraordinary. Jesus knew what was going to happen with Peter's life. Jesus knew God was going to take this blubbering idiot who never seemingly knew what to say and transform him in such a way that after Jesus rose from the dead, this normal, ordinary, can't speak guy was transformed into a preacher and a leader. In the book of Acts, after the resurrection, after Peter was changed by the Holy Spirit, Peter's preaching brought thousands and thousands of people to Jesus. Thousands of people experienced a life-changing relationship with God. Thousands of people experienced forgiveness of sins. God took the man that smelled like fish and made him a fisher of men. God took the man with no communication skills whatsoever and transformed him into one of the most gifted and one of the most honest speakers that the culture had ever seen. And in the book of Acts, after they preached, after Peter and John preached about how somebody could receive forgiveness for their sins and commit their lives to following Jesus... Acts 4.13, the council called them in and were asking them questions. And Peter was so bold and John was so bold that scripture tells us the members of the council were amazed when they saw the boldness of Peter and John. For they could see that they were ordinary men with no special training in scriptures. And they also recognized them as men who had been with Jesus. Both Peter and John were regular, ordinary men until God grabbed a hold of their lives. So how can you let God transform you into something extraordinary? We all know and we've all experienced that sense of normalcy. We're average. There's nothing special about us. But God can take our stuff that's not special and transform it into something extraordinary. Now, we talk every weekend about our mission as a church. It's to lead people to a life-changing relationship with Jesus. But we also understand that life change doesn't end when somebody commits to following Jesus. That life change doesn't end just because a person makes a commitment Jesus changes them on the inside. They're baptized. They wear the shirt. People celebrate. We recognize that life change doesn't end there. For instance, if you've given your life to Jesus, if you've committed your life to Jesus, are you still struggling with sin? Do you still wrestle with bad habits? Do you still wrestle with areas of your life? See, our mission is to lead you to life change. Our mission for our pastors is to continue to experience life change. Our next step classes are designed to help you continue to transform into the people God has created you to be. In our next step class that's coming up in August, August, 20, August 28th, you can sign up for these classes online. But in our classes, we discuss something called mission measures. Mission measures. What we mean by that is we try to answer the question, what does a committed follower of Jesus actually look like? We have seven questions that a follower of Jesus can ask themselves every single day. It's in the area of loving, for instance. You can ask the question, how am I treating others with kindness and respect today? That'll transform your life. When you talk about your family, when you think about your family, when you think about the people that you interact, how am I treating others with kindness and respect today? 
or in the area of growing. And all of these, you can find all of these when you sign up for a next step class. Okay, growing, how am I pursuing a deeper relationship with God? Or connecting, who am I getting real with in my life? Boy, that'll sharpen you. Forgiving, to whom am I extending grace? Serving, how am I meeting the needs of other people? Or inviting, who am I encouraging to follow Jesus? And in giving, how am I trusting God financially in my life? Those seven areas are areas that we believe if you really want to experience life change and you ask yourself those questions on a regular basis, we believe God will transform you into that person he's created you to be. God's gonna take you from the normal and allow you to experience that abundant, abnormal life. God's gonna take your ordinary life and he's gonna turn it into something extraordinary as you seek to follow him and you examine those seven areas of your life on a regular basis. So that next step event is August 28th. And if you're interested in discovering more about those questions that you can ask yourself, sign up online, calvaryaz.com. Get plugged in, sign up online and, and let God transform you. Because God does, he wants to take your ordinary and to turn it into something awesome. But it's up to you to become the person that God has created you to be. It takes work, it takes effort, and you have to be willing to invest in yourself so that you experience the marriage that God has for you, the relationships that God has for you, and the abundant life that God has for you. So sign up for one of those classes and become the person God's created you to be. Let's pray together. Father, we thank you that you take our normal and you allow us to experience the abnormal. Thank you, God, that you take our ordinary and you transform it into something extraordinary. And Father, it's our prayer that you would continue to change us and transform us into the people you have created us to be. Godly people that love you with all our heart, all our soul, all our mind, all our strength, and godly people that love our neighbor as ourselves. God, thanks. Thanks for loving us. Thank you that you never give up on us. And thank you that you care deeply for us. Continue to transform us as you transform this community. It's in Jesus' name we pray, amen.